Thank you. The role of finance and micro-entrepreneurship in the informal economy. This thesis was really inspired by a man known as Muhammad Yunus, who prior to my start here at the UIA made this statement. All people are entrepreneurs, but many don't have the opportunity to find that out. He made that um, prediction or that, that statement on the belief that if we that we can eradicate poverty from the face of the earth. We can create entrepreneurs in every human being. And I just want to share with you very briefly how he talks about this. One of the things that I see about the world, what it should be, uh, it's all a question of imagination. If we imagine today what kind of world we want, and that's the world we create. Everybody has the freedom to imagine in his or her way. My imagination is we want to create a world which will be absolutely free from poverty. Meaning that there will be no poor person on this planet anywhere in the world. And once we create that, we create poverty museums. So that people who would like to know what is it that used to be called poverty, how did it happen? So they will go into poverty museum, they take their children to poverty museum. That's the kind of world I would like to build. That's the world I would like to create. And this belief is by, by providing small loans to these poor individuals, we can create businesses and that they c we can eradicate poverty from the face of the earth. He received, uh, together with the bank he created in 2006, the Nobel Peace Prize. And of course, Post this, there's been a huge hype in this, and many organizations, not the least here in Kristiansand in Norway, uh, focusing on, on microfinance as a way to eradicate poverty. Now, shortly after this, there's been a lot of um, criticism, and pretty much around the start when I started my PhD program, we have people like Duvendak, Armendariz, Murdoch, Roadman, Murdoch, Bateman, saying there's very little, if not no, impact from microfinance. So kind of a consensus in the, in the research community that there is no positive impact from microfinance. Yet we're still doing it. Now practitioners are being a little bit wary. Can we still do this? So my question is, why is it that financing all microenterprises in the formal economy is not yielding a positive impact? Why? Why is it? And are all people in the world entrepreneurs? So I'm trying to position this thesis in the entrepreneurship field uh, where we see very little of this type of research. And I had to go back to 
Sean Peter, who really started his work in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an emerging Europe, very poor Europe, and he's wrote, writing here about the theory of economic development, which he continued upon writing a little bit later. He moved into different parts of the world, and, and his views on entrepreneurship changed. But essentially, he's saying that it's a dynamic framework where demand and supply interact in a circular flow, striving kind of to an equilibrium. And in this center, we have the entrepreneur who seeks to change the world to improve an economic, uh, an improved economic state. And he mentions through innovation and by combining available resources into new combinations, this is how that's happen been hap uh, happening. And he's also mentioning that entrepreneurs are a special type. So we see a lot of research on, on what kind of type of individuals we are talking about. Now, I think this is enterprising individuals that I'm looking at. Um, and the context is kind of an intersection of these enterprising individuals, so people who are striving to improve their life some way. There is a microfinance institution, and then there is the informal economy. And I really like this framework. This really made a big change into my thesis and the way I'm thinking about entrepreneurship. It's this process of entrepreneurship. You have it first there is an existence, there's the discovery of entrepreneurial opportunities, and then there's a the decision to exploit. And my main focus in this thesis and the three <coughs> essays that I've written are focused on the discovery phase and decision phase. I've talked a little bit about the existence in the introduction of my thesis. I'll come back to that. Research context, it's the informal economy. And by that, I do not mean these guys or girls. I mean, basically, informal businesses are businesses that operate out of sight of government regulation, either completely or in some sort of semi fashion. They are kind of a grayish field. It's a shadow economy, often called. It's not black or white. It could be that they have an employment contract, they don't have an employment contract, they ha may have a registration number, but they, they don't pay taxes. We'll come back to a little bit more about that. Why is it so important? Well, the majority, first of all, economic activity takes place in these enterprises. I show you that in the trial lecture. And for many developing countries like Ecuador, Tanzania, and India, employment affects more than 80% of the population. Yes, there's very, very little research on these economic uh, activities uh, because they're operating out of sight. Uh, we don't have the statistics. We don't have the data. It's very difficult to do research on these uh, businesses. What is an informal business? Well, here we have a man making shoes. We have a shop owner here. Uh, and they look similar uh, across the world in this kind of context. Here we have a restaurant. To get financing is very difficult. It's these banks are often in very, very dangerous zones, to so to collect data in this area was hugely uh, dangerous. This is the security walls uh, with fences above there, and you have a guard here, and just two weeks before I came here, uh, one of the guards had been shot. And my research team, which was basically me and a couple of master students, my master students were robbed at one point, at gunpoint, where their taxis being uh, pulled over by professional gangsters, and th uh, they lost their camera. So very, very dif difficult to do research in this context, especially where I have been. Now, I've been to Ecuador. It's right on the equator, yes, and you have the Galapagos Islands out here. Especially in the coastal regions here of Ecuador, this is where you have widespread informality. In Ecuador is a great country to study in informality because of this. Ecuador was also recently hit by an earthquake quake, which killed many, many thousands of people. So informality is widespread, and by collaborating with uh, one of the leading microfinance institutions in South America, uh, which uh, was actually started by uh, one of my supervisors, uh, and some others, and, uh, and, a and a Christian aid organization, uh, Banco de Miro, uh, they, I was able to get access to a lot of data. So um, I've been working with, uh, with uh, spending time with the credit officer, and, uh, and the bank collects really unique data. And most microfinance banks, they don't have that kind of data that, that you see uh, in this bank, so it's quite unique. And most microfinance banks don't really want, to want you to see all of this data. But they've been very open about this. I've been combi combining it with the national statistics, for instance, on the location, on where these, entrepreneurs, uh, these small businesses are located, on the if they how rural they are, for instance. Uh, and in addition, we made uh, 20-minute interviews of each of these 755 micro-entrepreneurs. 
20 minutes asking about 60 questions. I have data going back in time. I also have data after the, the survey was done. The first essay looks at how does resource abundance enhance microenterprise performance in the informal economy. This is co-written together with Professor Tron Rande also. Basically looking at the resource view of the firm, and excuse me for those who are not following completely the, the theories here, but resource-based view is, is the idea that we have resources in the firm that are unique and can provide somehow a competitive advantage, and, I and if so, it should be able to create some kind of a profit in the business. I, I include human capital theory that we can also invest in ourselves as a form of human capital. And I have some aspects of prospect theory, that the idea that individuals tend to exaggerate the fear of failure uh, in comparison to sure gain. And therefore, we may expect to see more variability in performance in this country, in this context. One very key contribution I'm doing, which is unique and different from most other research, is that when you talk about firm performance, we assume that that's, that's universal. Uni it's either good or bad. Or it's, you know, we can say profits, that's performance. Return on assets is performance. Um, I'm combining all three concepts here because it's very important. Performance could be different depending on what you're looking for. Net income is, of course, performance when we're looking at how much money are we making. Return on assets, how much money are we making in relationship to how much money we put in. Sales growth, uh, if you're making money, but, and you have good re performance the returns, but you're not growing, you're not creating any value in the business. So that's why you have to include sales growth. I spent a lot of time fine-tuning these numbers and adjusting in order to, to come up with sensible numbers. You can read more about that in my thesis. I think one key thing I found was, for instance, the return level. We always often talk about interest rates being very high in this lending Lendings. Lending 30% interest rate to a poor person. I'm not sure how many of you would like to pay an interest rate of 30% on your mortgage. Uh, but that's essentially what they're paying. And, you know, is this unethical? Well, I'm finding that the average return, average return is 60%. So on average, if you put in one kroner and you get one more than one kroner back, it's a good, de good deal. It should be, potentially. So it's saying that we shouldn't be so focused on the interest rate. It's more on the, the return and on the growth. So th coming back to the prospect theory, saying I'm saying that based on the riskiness of these ma micro-enterprise investment opportunities, it would be rational for a micro-entrepreneur to demand a higher financial return if they chose to expand their business activities by using debt. So I'm finding that in the cross-sectional analysis, that is supported both for return on assets and sales growth. So that basically says that those who would like to take on debt, they require a priori a higher return on assets and they also have higher sales growth. Because in the event of failure, there is no, like, there is no limited downside. It's an unlimited downside. So you need to self-precaution. You need to be the kind of a, a selection, if you want, there, biased, which I'm capturing here. This is how the you know, those, uh, that's how I'm capturing that, which is interesting. The other thing, which is kind of key, and links back to this idea that microfinance is not working, is the idea, here I'm looking at, what is the effect of leverage, meaning having more debt in this way, on your balance sheet, what's the effect on the performance? And I'm finding it, in the cross-sectional analysis, it, it positively, associates it with return on assets and profits, meaning that you have more, uh, more money at the end of the day on your table. Uh, when I look at the panel, which has more years, I only find support for profits. So this suggests that microcredit does help small businesses earn a little bit more money, puts more money on the table. But very importantly, it's not helping sales growth. The businesses are not growing. Remember, I mentioned that before, it implies that there is no value creation being done here. Big problem. Then I looked at what's the relationship between the human capital investment, the, man, the investments we do in terms of education, uh, the experience we have. And basically, we would expect that, for instance, with experience, we get more 
experience that would improve our performance. That was my kind of thinking here. But it's actually shown here when it looks like with experience, it actually looks like this, negative, and then accelerates <laughs> at the end. So it's in reversed picture. So education is not benefiting performance, and with experience it's even negative and accelerating. That's not good. The other, I, I lift out the important thing, is I, I, I found here a negative and curvilinear association between firm size and firm performance. And there's been a lot of discussions about this in the literature that we s for the first years when you expand, when you grow in size, you earn lower and lower returns. Indeed, I'm finding this, not only lower and lower returns, but also profits, which means that size is not always good. It's not always good to be, be bigger. You double your business, you may earn half the money than you did before. That's a challenge in this context. So it's up to a certain limit, uh, you, you are actually in negative territory. And then, it's, it's a, as your business gets a little bit bigger, you start seeing the positive scale kick in. My second paper looks at the impact of your entrepreneur characteristics and firm characteristics into the financing decision. It's a big, big stream of literature on this, particularly in formal businesses, where they particularly find that it's actually the firm characteristics that matter. Here, I find, um, and I skip the theories a little bit here, so we save some time. Uh, here, we find <coughs> that actually entrepreneur characteristics matter. I also find, for instance, the age matters, being financially literate matter matters, and not married had an important impact on the decision to take on debt. Uh, other firm characteristics which are kind of similar to formal uh, other research uh, in general is quite supported as well, but size is more important than in a formal context. In terms of how much debt you take on, there was very little from entrepreneurial characteristics, but being financially literate, understanding finance made a big impact. Obviously, we would kind of think, but that's now documented and proven. Education had no impact, but skills do. Other things, again, size. Also, I found that rural, being a bit located on the countryside, meant that people took on a little bit more loan, possibly as a selection bias. But that was not a part of my hypothesis. The third and final essay looks at financial literacy, role models, and performance. Here again, the same resource-based view. There's been work previously by Lusardi and Mitchell and Aldrich on, on role models. The connection is here, we have find this concept of financial literacy and um, impact on performance. We have this idea of role models, knowing a successful role model, uh, and that impact on financial performance. I've been developing questions for measuring and understanding financial literacy. Basically three questions. I modified the third question to fit this context. You can read more about that in my thesis. I also have uh, questions on successful role models, which has been mostly used to capture this in relationship to entrepreneurial intentions. Um, but here I'm using it for the first time in order to measure it on the, firm, on the impact of firm performance. And my, my findings show that financial literacy, the top line here, is positively related, associated, with return on assets and profits. It's not affecting sales growth again. Um, I'm also finding that role models is affecting return on assets. What I'm not showing you here is that the level of financial literacy is extremely low in this context. Um, so it, it's really troublesome, the low level of financial literacy that I was able to capture in this context. So we ext we're basically lo lending money to people who don't understand uh, what a loan and an interest rate is. That's troublesome. Summary of key findings. Microcredit supports return on assets and profits, uh, particularly profits. Sales growth is not affected. So despite growth intent, I'm measuring growth, uh, by the way, in, in my papers. I see they have an intention to grow, but it's not coming through. So microcredit does put more money on the table, but it's not helping businesses grow. 
There's also a negative and curvilinear association between size and firm performance. This actually means that it could be very dangerous to extend more loans to certain individual businesses. So microcredit institutions need to be extend some caution. Uh, and that's also been voiced by some uh, USAID organizations also. In, but bigger is not always better. Entrepreneurial characteristics, important, especially being financially literate. Uh, but also this idea of size is much more important in the, in the, financing, deci in, in the financing decision. Financial literacy, again, being very, very poor level, uh, but being financially literate leads to improved decision making. And that's probably also a very important finding. It's basically, if human capital investments uh, they've made, they've gone to school for five years, and if the experience does not improve their performance, which it should, according to research, uh, it just means that the human capital is so poorly developed that, we, that, that being economically literate is key in this context. Uh, and then we have the role, knowing successful role models. And to sum up, uh, takeaways for practitioners. So despite criticism, does micro credit does put a little extra money on the table. However, growth is difficult. Uh, it may even come at a cost. Bigger is not necessarily better. Therefore, I'm suggesting that maybe we should switch focus. I'm su actually, I'm, su I'm suggesting we should switch focus from micro enterprises and focus more on the small and medium enterprises, where you can get, where you have educated CEOs, where you have uh, the scale economies kicking in. Uh, very important. So I think mi microfinance as a field should really start to migrate into small and medium-sized businesses, rethink their concept. It's not necessarily good that, that all people are entrepreneurs. We want to have some employees as well. Uh, financial literacy is uncomfortably low, I'm finding that, and uh, I'm pushing therefore that for large social reforms. We really focus on economic literacy. We need universities like the University of Agder to step up and uh, and uh, do something about the poor business education in some countries. Thank you.